Hey guys, Nintendo here. If you've been tuning in for a while, you're probably familiar with our Top 5 Rarest Games series. From the iconic NES to the enigmatic Wii U, we've traversed the realms of Nintendo's consoles and handhelds, unearthing all those elusive titles that hold a special place in the hearts of collectors. But just as the gaming landscape evolves, so does the value of those classic adventures. That's why today I'm thrilled to take you on a journey that's not only a blast of nostalgia, but also an exploration of the changing tides of the retro game market. As we revisit these entries, I'll be there to keep you updated on how the landscape has transformed. So, from past to present, join me as we rewind and take a look back at both gaming history and the history of this channel with this marathon-style compilation. Let's get to it. All right, so we're going to be going in chronological order based on when each system released. So first up is the top five rarest NES games, which I uploaded all the way back in April of 2017. Let's take a look. Hey guys, Nintendo here. It's time for another installment in my rarest game series. Today we'll count down through the most expensive and sought after trophies of the Nintendo Entertainment System library. You might want to sit down for this one. Some of these prices are unbelievable. <laughs> Let's take a look. Alright, so just to set the stage here before we begin, this list will cover the rarest NES titles that were officially licensed by Nintendo and published in the US. So I won't be covering games like uh, the Nintendo World Championships cartridges because those were not available to the general public. And we also won't go over games like the Myriad 6-in-1 cartridge, Cheetah Men 2, or uh, Bubble Bath Babes <laughs> because they were not officially licensed releases. This list is simply the, the rarest games that were licensed and sold in North America. So with that in mind, starting off in 5th place is Bonk's Adventure. The Bonk series was the leading franchise of the TurboGrafx-16 console throughout the early 90s, but the franchise also had a little-known NES port with a very limited release. At the time of this video, Bonk's Adventure has a market value of just under $500. And now in 2023, this title will actually run you over $900. The game was released for NES in 1993, a year which you may notice was well into the lifespan of the Super Nintendo, which itself launched in 1991. Because of this late launch and limited publicity, the game sold poorly and fell into obscurity, which I think you will find is a common theme for many of the titles on this list. Coming in at number 4, and my personal favorite on this list, is Panic Restaurant. Panic Restaurant is a food-themed 2D platformer in which the player takes on the role of Chef Cookie and must take back his own restaurant from his nemesis and rival chef, Odove. At the time of this video, Panic Restaurant, similarly to Bonk's Adventure, is valued right around $500. This one hasn't exploded quite as much as Bonk's Adventure, but you will still be forking over about $715 for Panic Restaurant in 2023. The game was published by Taito Corporation in 1992. A combination of scarcity and engaging gameplay have made this cult classic a prized collector's item. Next on the list at number 3 is The Flintstones Surprise at Dinosaur Peak. This title was also published by Taito well into the Super Nintendo lifespan in 1993. The game has a current market value of over $670. And today, that has jumped to a whopping $1,465. Rumor has it that this game was never sold in stores, but was rather a blockbuster video exclusive, available only for rental. If you've watched my rarest games on Nintendo 64 video, this story might sound a little familiar. Like Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut and Stunt Racer 64, Dinosaur Peak had a very limited print run, and because of this limited run, it has become one of the hardest to find cartridges of the NES library. Alright, coming in at number 2 is Little Samson. Like Panic Restaurant and Dinosaur Peak before it, Little Samson is a 2D platformer published by Taito. Once again, this game saw a very late release when it hit store shelves in 1992. At the time of this video, Little Samson has a market value of nearly $1,200. Of course, now, almost six years later, that has ballooned to over $2,200. Little Samson plays very much like the Mega Man series, and has a unique and engaging mechanic by which the player can swap between four characters on the fly and approach platforming segments with a variety of strategies. This is another title which became somewhat of a hidden gem in recent years, which, along with its very limited print run, has led to an ongoing surge in value. Finally coming in at first place, the rarest title on NES, Family Fun Fitness Stadium Events. Currently, Stadium Events has a staggering market value of over $9,000. No Dragon Ball Z references intended. And as if $9,000 wasn't ridiculous enough, today a loose copy of Stadium Events is liable to run you over $16,000. 
Unlike the other titles in this list, Stadium Events was published in 1987 during the peak of the NES's success. However, in the wake of its launch, Bandai seemed to have caught Nintendo's eye. Just days after the game released, it was pulled from store shelves as Nintendo purchased the right to the title themselves, and rebranded the game as World Class Track Meet. This is also the origin of the NES Power Pad, which had originally been designed and produced by Bandai as the Bandai Family Fun Fitness Floor Pad. <laughs> kind of a mouthful. As a result, it's estimated that there may be less than 200 copies in existence, making it the rarest game ever released on the platform. Okay, so that was the NES, and uh, man, a lot of those prices are almost double what they used to be about six years ago. But Panic Restaurant hasn't blown up quite as much, so I guess that's something. <laughs> Alright, so next up in chronological order is the original Game Boy. Hey guys, Nintendrew here. Once again, I am back to talk about some of the rarest and most coveted titles in video game history, this time for the original Game Boy. In this retrospective, we'll be taking a look at the top five rarest titles ever released for Nintendo's flagship handheld. So, let's get right to it. First up is Toxic Crusaders. Toxic Crusaders is a side-scrolling action platformer based on the 1991 American cartoon series of the same name. The game also saw ports for NES and Sega Genesis, although each version has its own differences in levels, design, and gameplay. In this version, players choose between one of five characters and join the fight to protect their city from the evil Dr. Killamoth. Although Toxic Crusaders could be found for much cheaper as recent as 2016, collectors have started to take notice of its rarity and its current market value has skyrocketed to upwards of $100. And if you thought that was bad, today a loose copy will run you over $330, more than triple its value at the time of the original video. The title itself was pretty poorly received, which likely led to low sales figures on top of an already limited print run. The game has seen less than 10 completed sales on eBay in the past year, so if you happen to come across it for cheap in the wild at a local game store, make sure you don't pass this one up. Next is F1 Pole Position. Now this one has an interesting story. Although it's flown under the radar for many collectors over the past decade, more recent listings for F1 Pole Position have been so few and far between that its price has absolutely exploded. The European release, in contrast, is fairly easy to come across, but the NTSC cart is a different story. According to my research, there may have been as few as three copies sold across eBay and Amazon over the past year. At the time of this video, Pole Position's current market value is estimated at $150. This one hasn't jumped quite as drastically, but in 2023, it'll run you about 215 bucks. Despite sharing a name and promotional art with F1 Pole Position for Super Nintendo, which was developed by Human Entertainment, this release is actually an unrelated port of F1 Hero GB92, a Japanese exclusive title developed by Very. It's not well documented why Ubisoft decided to adopt the same label, but it's safe to say it made their marketing job much easier. At number three is Jimmy Connors Tennis. Jimmy Connors Tennis, as you might have gathered, is a tennis game featuring the retired world-renowned tennis player Jimmy Connors. And while its gameplay is nothing spectacular, this title is yet another striking example of the recent surge in the retro gaming market. Just a few years ago, in 2014, you may have been able to find a copy for under $5, but not anymore. Recent auctions place this title's value upwards of $170. This one's actually dropped pretty significantly in value since the time of the original video, and today it'll run you a little over $100, which is admittedly still way too much for a tennis game. I've always been surprised to find a sports title in a console's rarest game lineup, but this seems to be a different beast entirely. Through all my research, I can't seem to find a concrete explanation for this game's enormous jump in value, but with less than 5 recorded sales in the past 12 months, it's certainly earned a place on our list. Coming in at number 2 is Spud's Adventure. Alright, this one requires a bit of backstory. If you've spent any time at all collecting for Game Boy, you're no doubt familiar with Acclaim's 1990 puzzle game Quirk, developed by Atlas. This title was originally called Puzzle Boy in Japan, and Spud's Adventure is a spin-off from this original title. Presumably in an effort to appeal to a more Western audience, Acclaim decided that they would take the game's titular potato protagonist and turn him into a tomato with sunglasses. However, in the year following Quirk's launch, Acclaim lost the license to publish the Puzzle Boy series, and Atlas released this title, Spud's Adventure, in its original and unedited form. Like its mainline counterpart, Spud's Adventure features puzzle mechanics, but it also throws in some action and RPG elements to keep the formula interesting. Today, the title sells for right around $200. 
Oh man, this one hurts. Today it looks like Spud's Adventure is actually the most expensive original Game Boy title. Its current market value is about $570. As far as I understand, Spud's Adventure was not received super well, and I can confirm from personal experience that the game can be super frustrating, especially with its recurring theme of long winding paths that lead to dead ends and constant backtracking. Like many other early Atlas titles, this game saw a very limited print run, which certainly has done nothing to lower its value. And finally, the rarest title for Game Boy is... Amazing Tater. Deja vu, right? This is the first time in this video series that we've seen two titles from the same franchise in a console's top five rarest games. Amazing Tater is a direct follow-up to Quirk, and was released in Japan as Puzzle Boy 2. If you've played the original, it can be pretty jarring to see such a similar title at the peak of the Game Boy's rarest releases, but indeed, this little-known sequel saw a significantly reduced print run and minor notoriety within the retro gaming community, keeping its market value consistently high throughout recent years. So how much does it go for? Today, Amazing Tater can sell for a whopping $300. And today, today, that has grown to an even more staggering $415. If trends continue to hold, we might see this one continue to rise in the future. Quite a lot of cash to drop on a title which is basically a rehashed expansion of a very common game. But once again, Atlas has topped off our list and secured Amazing Tater as the rarest title for the original Game Boy. Alright, so that was the original Game Boy, and uh, I, as far as the, the rarest titles, I think the only one that I didn't cover in that video that has now kind of increased in value is it, Avenging Spirit is worth about $285, so that's another one of the, uh, the rarest Game Boy titles to look out for. Next up in our marathon is the top 5 rarest Super Nintendo titles. Hey guys, Nintendrew here, and yes, it's time for the next installment in my rarest game series. This time, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System takes the stage. In this video, we'll be covering the top 5 rarest and most sought after titles in the Super Nintendo library. So let's get right into it. Alright, first things first, as always, this list will be based on the value each game commands in the used game market. Of course, value is not a perfectly reliable metric for measuring a title's rarity, but it is currently the best method we have, and it's the method that I've chosen to use for this list. And as with the other videos in this series, this top 5 list will not include any special edition titles, which are otherwise available for cheap, like the Exertainment Mountain Bike Rally and Speed Racer Combo Kart, or titles which were otherwise not available in store shelves, like the Star Fox Super Weekend cartridge. This list will only cover titles which were available to the public on store shelves. So with those details out of the way, first up is Mega Man X3. If you're at all familiar with the Mega Man series, you've probably at least heard of the Mega Man X subseries, which started with Mega Man X on the Super NES. And as the name would imply, Mega Man X3 is the third and final Super Nintendo entry. This title follows in the footsteps of its predecessors as a run-and-gun action platformer, and is the first entry in the series to feature Zero as a playable character. At the time of this video, Mega Man X3 is worth right around $200. This one has increased, but maybe not as much as you might expect. It's worth about $285 in 2023. Reviews were generally positive, and critics seemed to enjoy the new entry's gameplay, despite its clear similarities to those titles which came before it. As far as its rarity is concerned, it's not exactly clear why this game is in such high demand, but seeing as it was released in early 1996, the same year as the release of the Nintendo 64, Mega Man X3 may have just had a relatively lower attach rate as its console was nearing the end of its production run. Combine that with a more recent interest of collectors to complete a Mega Man series collection, and you've got yourself a recipe for scarcity. Next is Final Fight Guy. If you've watched my video on the rarest Nintendo 64 titles, or if you're otherwise aware of the story behind Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut, the history behind this title's rarity should sound familiar. Final Fight Guy is an enhanced version of Final Fight, an earlier Super Nintendo title, but for the majority of its print run, this re-release was only available as a rental game from Blockbuster Video in North America. This means the only way collectors could get a hold of the game was to buy it from the store after they quit renting out Super Nintendo titles, or from a store liquidation when they went out of business entirely. Today, Final Fight Guy fetches prices upwards of $220 on the used game market. And today, Final Fight Guy will cost you almost $370. Much like Sculptor's Cut, this re-release is very similar to the original with just a few extra features, namely some power-ups and difficulty settings. But the title's very limited launch has secured itself a place on this list. Next up, Pocky and Rocky 2. Pocky and Rocky is a unique shoot-em-up series where players take on the role of protagonist Pocky and throw cards at oncoming enemies to progress through branching environments. Additionally, the game features a variety of familiars, such as Rocky the Raccoon, to lend assistance through each level with special abilities. 
Like the first title, Pocky and Rocky 2 can also be played as a real-time co-op game with a friend. Although both this title and its predecessor are considered cult classics with a strong demand in the retro game scene, this sequel is far more valuable with a current market value of over $250. And in 2023, that has almost doubled to about $450. The exact cause of this title's scarcity is not certain, but as a little-known sequel in an already obscure series, it's not too much of a stretch to assume Pocky and Rocky 2 was likely published in pretty low numbers. Next on the list is Hagane The Final Conflict. Hagane is a side-scrolling action platformer in which you play as a cyborg ninja on a quest to rid the world of an opposing ninja faction. Much like Final Fight Guy, this title is rumored to have been at least a timed exclusive through Blockbuster Video. The game is most apparently pretty visually stunning, and appears to be inspired by similar titles like those in the Shinobi series. Just five years ago, you might have been able to come across a copy for under 100 bucks, but today, Hagane goes for right around $620. What a jump. And maybe not quite as much of a jump, but from the time of that video to now, it's going for a little over $810. In addition to its very limited print run, Hagane is respected as a bit of a hidden gem in the Super Nintendo library, with compelling gameplay and responsive controls resulting in highly inflated demand. And finally, at number one, the rarest title on the Super Nintendo is Aero Fighters. Originally launched as an arcade title in 1992, Aero Fighters was ported to the Super Nintendo two years later in 94. Rumor has it that this port was published in very limited numbers leading to widespread rarity. The game is a traditional vertical scrolling shoot 'em up title, which tasks the player with taking on an unknown alien force bent on total world domination. Today, the game is worth a staggering $750. <laughs> yeah, you wish. In 2023, Aero Fighter's market value is nearly $1,200. Although Aero Fighters was known as one of the most accurate and faithful arcade to home console conversions, its limited print run and relative obscurity has made this game a very sought after collector's item and has solidified it as the number one rarest title on the platform. All right, so that was the Super Nintendo. And uh, as far as other titles that would have made the list today, it looks like Harvest Moon and Wild Guns both have market values around $400 today. So they've also been climbing the charts. And next up is the top five rarest Virtual Boy titles. Hey guys, Nintendrew here. The Virtual Boy is a strange and iconic pillar of Nintendo's long and storied past, in no small part due to its very small release list. In total, only 14 Virtual Boy games hit store shelves in North America, making it an attractive target for collectors looking to complete a system's library. However, even though there aren't that many games to find, it still has its fair share of hidden gems and highly sought after titles. In this video, we'll be counting down through the top five rarest Virtual Boy games, so I'll give you a moment to hide your wallets and we'll get started after the intro. All right, let's get to it. Starting off at spot number five on our list is Vertical Force. Vertical Force is a top-down 2D scrolling shooter on a 3D console, which might seem odd at first, but the developers made use of this revolutionary hardware by allowing players to move their ship between two distinct layers of depth, into and out of the background. By swapping between them, you can collect power-ups and dodge enemies strategically through the third dimension. This title was developed by Hudson Soft and is strikingly similar to their Star Soldier series. At the time of this video, a loose copy of Vertical Force is worth right about $70. And today, just a little over a year after that video, that title's actually dropped down to about $60. Now, you won't get too much replayability out of this one. It can actually be beaten in under half an hour, and it only has four distinct levels. But if you're collecting for the Virtual Boy and you're a fan of arcade shooters, you could certainly do worse. Next up at number four is Nestor's Funky Bowling. This is obviously a bowling title, and it stars Nestor of Nintendo Power fame, based on the Howard and Nestor comics. This one was developed by Sapphire, a now-defunct US-based studio, and was only launched stateside, so this one was interestingly a US exclusive. Players can compete as Nestor or his identical twin sister, Hester, in a variety of game modes, with each supporting either single-player or head-to-head -head competition with a friend. Now, as far as I know, this is the only game that ever saw Nestor star as the main character, and I wouldn't be surprised if this title's value were to hold or increase as time goes on. Today, a loose copy of Nestor's Funky Bowling will run you right around $85. This title's also dropped down a bit, down to a market value of about 75 bucks. 
Even as a pretty generic bowling game, this title is still an odd and compelling part of Nintendo history, and will likely attract the eye of collectors for many years to come. Coming in at number three is 3D Tetris. Okay, this one I think is actually pretty cool. 3D Tetris is arguably the biggest departure from the standard Tetris gameplay in the entire series. It sees players dropping three-dimensional wireframe representations of Tetris pieces into a sort of box-shaped well away from the player's perspective. It even has fun little characters in the corner associated with each piece. Yeah, that doesn't really add anything, but it's kind of fun nonetheless. As far as value is concerned, this one is worth upwards of $150 on the used market. 3D Tetris has pretty much held its value over the past year, but today it'll run you a little bit less at about 140 bucks. 3D Tetris was the final Virtual Boy game released in North America, and although reception by critics was mixed upon launch, it has come to be considered one of the better experimental experiences on the platform. At number two on our list is Waterworld. Uh, yes, that Waterworld. This Virtual Boy title was based on the Kevin Costner movie of the same name, and was promoted around the time of the movie's debut. Uh, unfortunately, as is often the case with movie tie-in games, uh, both when it was first released and upon later reflection, it's generally agreed that this is one of the worst games to be released on what was already one of Nintendo's most denigrated systems. But that doesn't stop the retro game market from inflating this title's price. Oh, quite the contrary. Likely due to low initial sales on an already floundering platform, Waterworld is exceedingly hard to come by, and at the time of this video, it's worth right about $220. Thankfully, this title has dropped in value uh, not a whole lot, though. It's worth about $180 in 2023. If you're going for a complete library, you might have to fork over some serious cash for this one. But if you're more of a casual collector, you're not missing out on much. And finally, at number one on our list, the rarest title for Virtual Boy is... Jack Brothers. This game is an Atlas title, and if you've watched this rarest game series before, you probably know they often appear at the top of these lists. Atlas is notorious for really low print runs of games that actually have pretty compelling gameplay. Interestingly enough, this one is a spin-off of Atlas's Megami Tensei series, and was actually the first title in that series to release outside of Japan. The game features top-down action, where you play as one of the three titular Jack brothers trying to return to his home dimension before the portal closes at the end of Halloween. It's a decent title with some entertaining gameplay and also a pretty catchy soundtrack. It's one of the few that's really worth playing, which makes its price that much more devastating. Today, a loose copy of Jack Brothers can fetch prices upwards of $900. And just like the other titles on this list, Jack Bros has actually dropped in value since the time of this video and is now worth about $800. Of course, if you manage to find a copy with a manual and or a box, that price can jump to almost double. So if you see a copy of Jack Bros hanging around your mom's attic or at a local yard sale, definitely give it a second look. All right, so that does it for the Virtual Boy, and shockingly, it seems like this is the first one on our list where every title has actually dropped in value, which, from a consumer standpoint, is good to see. Not to say that the titles aren't still incredibly overpriced, but, you know, at least uh, they haven't been on the uptrend. All right, next up on this list is my personal favorite, the Nintendo 64. Hey guys, Nintendrew here. It's time yet again for the next installment of our Rarest Game series. In this video, we'll be covering some of the most coveted and valuable titles for one of my favorite consoles of all time, the Nintendo 64. So, join me as we count down through the top 5 rarest games in the 64 library. Let's get to it. Alright, first things first, let's cover the basics. As always, for this list, we won't be considering any special edition bundles or not-for-resale demo carts. All prices mentioned will be in reference to their loose North American cartridge values, and each title has been ranked based on a combination of its current market value and estimated scarcity. With that in mind, starting off at number 5 is Bomberman 64 The Second Attack. Bomberman 64 The Second Attack is, of course, the sequel to Bomberman 64, and is the third overall entry in the series for Nintendo 64 after Bomberman Hero. 
Much like its predecessor, the game features a full single-player story campaign starring the White Bomber, as well as the traditional frantic multiplayer mayhem that the franchise is well known for. Unlike the first entry, however, this title has become a highly sought-after collector's item in the years following its release. At the time of this video, Bomberman 64 The Second Attack holds a value of around $125 on the used game market. And as of today, just about three years later than that original video, uh, that has almost doubled to about $230. The reason for its price and rarity may be due to a few compounding factors. For one, the first game was met with fairly mixed reviews, which may have affected sales of its sequel. On top of that, the game was released in mid-2000, toward the end of the 64's lifespan, and the market was already pretty saturated with other Bomberman titles at the time of its launch. These circumstances, as well as a limited marketing campaign, led to poor overall sales and have secured this game's place at number 5 on our list. Next up, coming in at number 4, is Worms Armageddon. Worms Armageddon is a turn-based strategy game and the third major entry in the widely successful Worms franchise. If you're unfamiliar with the series, players are tasked with controlling a team of characters decked out with a wide arsenal of weaponry, and must strategically navigate through each level's destructible terrain to take down the opposing team. While Worms has seen overall positive reception and countless new entries in the decades following its debut, this particular release for the Nintendo 64 was not nearly as popular as its PC counterpart. If you want to pick it up today, be ready to fork over some serious cash. Worms Armageddon currently runs for about $140. And with Worms Armageddon, we've seen another $100 jump because it is worth about $240 today. The biggest factor which led to this title's rarity was its limited production run. Because the series saw most of its success from PC, publisher Infogrames chose to keep numbers low to avoid losing money. This limited release, alongside some genuinely fun gameplay, has kept Worms Armageddon in the sights of seasoned collectors ever since. Moving right along, at number 3 is Stunt Racer. On the surface, Stunt Racer 64 might seem like your typical racing game, but there are a few interesting details that set this title apart. For starters, the game features a classic roster of vintage cars, and gives players the ability to perform wild mid-air stunts such as flips and barrel rolls to rack up extra cash. But perhaps more interesting are the circumstances surrounding its launch. Stunt Racer was released in October of 2000 exclusively through Blockbuster Video, the now-defunct movie rental chain. Because of this exclusive release, the title saw a very limited print run and has been climbing in value in recent years. Today, a loose copy of Stunt Racer 64 can sell for upwards of $200. Of course, this one's also jumped over the past three years and is now at about $340. Of course, due to the nature of rental stores, a complete copy is even more difficult to find and can fetch as much as three times the value. If you happen to come across this one in the wild, don't pass it up. Next up, coming in at number two on our list, is Super Bowling. Unlike some of the other titles on this list, which have stayed fairly consistent or sometimes even dropped in value, this game in particular has been on a steady rise for years. Super Bowling is a remake of a little-known Super Nintendo title by the same name. For the most part, it's pretty much just your typical bowling game, but one unique feature comes in the form of its golf mode, which tasks players with knocking down a specific arrangement of pins within a given par. Unfortunately, this version of Super Bowling was released in 2001, the same year we were introduced to the GameCube, and because it launched so late into the 64 lifespan, it was passed over by a majority of consumers, leading to very low sales figures. Today, the game commands a staggering $330 on the used game market. And yet again, we've got another decent price hike, as today, Super Bowling runs about $560. Interestingly, Super Bowling was not all that difficult to find for cheap as recently as 2015, but once word started to spread that copies were drying up, avid collectors were quick to jump on the title. Add to that recent rumors that Super Bowling may have also been a rental store exclusive, and you've got yourself a recipe for rarity. And finally, coming in at number one on our list, the rarest title for Nintendo 64 is... Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut. <music> Clay
Clay Fighter Sculptor's Cut is an arcade-style fighting game and an updated re-release of Clay Fighter 63 and a third. This newer version was nearly identical to the original, but included a roster of four new characters, a new intro sequence, and a few minor adjustments to the combat system. Like Stunt Racer 64 before it, Sculptor's Cut was a blockbuster video exclusive, but unlike Stunt Racer, this title was only available for rent. That means the only copies which still exist today were either rented from Blockbuster and never returned, or sold when Nintendo 64 games were being phased out of the catalog. Today, a used copy of Sculptor's Cut can sell for a whopping $400. <laughs> if you thought that was bad, today the game sells in excess of $1,000. It's not really clear how many units of this game were produced, but the general consensus seems to be that there were no more than 20,000 made, with possibly as few as 5,000 copies left in circulation today. And with that, Play Fighter Sculptor's Cut has secured its place on our list as the number one rarest game for Nintendo 64. All right, so that was the N64, and, you know, it, it kind of makes sense, like, with that nostalgia for the N64 era, it seems like the market has taken notice, and each of those games have almost doubled in value, if not more. At one time, it was probably one of the best systems to collect for, because there were less than 300 titles. Uh, Any more, I don't know, but still, the 64 holds a very special place in my heart. Okay, moving right along, next up is the top five rarest games for the Game Boy Color. Hey guys, Nintendrew here, and today's video is the next installment in our Rarest Game series. We've covered the Game Boy, we've covered the Game Boy Advance, but today it's all about the Game Boy Color. In this video, we'll be counting down through the top five most sought after and valuable titles in the GBC library. And there are some pretty cool games on this list, including a few hidden gems you might want to keep your eye out for. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, just to get started, as usual, I'm going to lay down a couple of ground rules for this list. Each of these titles were selected based on a number of factors, including current market value, production numbers, and demand. Additionally, this list will not consider any special or limited edition releases, which are otherwise available for cheap, and each of these titles were officially licensed by Nintendo for sale in North America. So with that out of the way, first up at number 5 is Survival Kids. Survival Kids is, appropriately enough, a survival role-playing game developed by Konami and released in 1999. At first glance, this game kind of reminded me of something like Don't Starve, this sort of island survival type premise. The game starts with a kid and his father celebrating his 10th birthday by setting off on a gigantic cruise liner with no other crew on board but the two of them. Clearly this father has more money than brain cells. Long story short, the boat is caught in a devastating storm and the child washes ashore on a deserted island where he must fend for himself while awaiting rescue. Kind of a dark premise for a Game Boy game. The gameplay almost feels like a slightly more forgiving roguelite title. When visiting your shelter, you can choose to save the game and continue, so there's no true permadeath, but otherwise a lot of the same tropes are there. You'll have to quickly find water, materials, and a source of food to survive through the night if you have any hope of eventually being reunited with your family. At the time of this video, Survival Kids is worth right around $40 on the retro game market. Oh man, I wish I had jumped on that at $40. Today, it has almost quadrupled and is worth about 155 bucks. What really makes this game interesting is that it has a total of eight different endings depending on how long you're able to survive and how quickly you can manage to be rescued or escape the island, including one ending which requires you to find another stranded lost kid, keep all the food to yourself, and let them starve to death. No idea how this one flew by with an E for everyone rating. But regardless, the game's mechanics are pretty compelling, and the soundtrack is excellent to boot, so I've gotta say, for what it's worth, Survival Kids is a solid adventure title that's worth a second look. Coming in at number 4 is Wendy Every Which Way. This one is a side-scrolling action platformer starring Wendy the Good Little Witch, a spin-off character from the Casper the Friendly Ghost series. At first glance, the core mechanic of swapping the direction of gravity immediately reminds me of the indie darling VVVVVV. But looking even further back, the title shares a lot in common with the NES game Metal Storm, which makes sense as the developers were apparently directly inspired by that earlier title. Developed by WayForward Technologies in 2001, Windy Every Which Way was meant as a tie-in for an animated series reboot of the same name, but unfortunately that cartoon never saw the light of day, which might explain the game's low production numbers. On top of that, the game was almost universally praised by critics for its tight platforming and polished presentation, which no doubt has continued to push the title into the spotlight for avid collectors. As of today, the game has a market value of right around $50. I'm 
this one hasn't seen quite as drastic a jump in those past four years, but is still worth significantly more at $130. Something that I found pretty unique about this one is that the title has three exclusive levels which can only be accessed by using the cartridge through the backwards compatibility of the Game Boy Advance. As far as I know, only a handful of Game Boy Color titles had this sort of feature limitation, which makes me wonder if the developer might have found a way to utilize some extra resources provided by the newer system. Either way, Windy Every Which Way is another great title which has seen more praise and attention in recent years and may be worth keeping an eye out for. At number 3 is Resident Evil Gaiden. You might remember that I briefly mentioned this title in my video about 5 lost Nintendo games which were rediscovered and saved for posterity, but unlike the unreleased Resident Evil 1 prototype for Game Boy Color, this game was a fully realized top-down action-adventure title with arguably much better controls and mechanics for the system. The story sees players investigating a cruise ship which has suffered a massive viral outbreak, and tasks you with searching the environment for clues and items while defending yourself from a horde of zombies. Unfortunately, the game saw lukewarm critical reception and never really managed to grab its market, which undoubtedly resulted in poor overall sales and, in turn, general scarcity. Today, the game can go for upwards of $55 on the second-hand market. And there's another painful price increase for you because Resident Evil Gaiden today will cost you $100 more at $155. My favorite thing about this game has got to be its first-person combat mechanic. Obviously, the Game Boy Color isn't particularly suited for your standard first- or third-person shooting controls, so the devs opted to change it up with a time-based slider mechanic where the player has to hit the attack button within a certain range while the cursor is traveling back and forth across the screen. Normal hits will inflict body shots, while a dead-on bullseye will result in a headshot. It's not anything super revolutionary, but I thought it was a neat solution for that problem. Definitely check this one out if you are a fan of the series. Next up at number 2 is the Singer Isaac Sewing Machine Operation Software. This is one of those cases where I kind of struggled with deciding whether to include this title or leave it off the list, because in the strictest sense, this is certainly not a game. But because it was an official release for the Game Boy Color, and because it has such an interesting backstory, I thought it deserved a spot here. The Singer Isaac was an electric sewing machine powered by the Game Boy Color, which was originally developed by a Japanese sewing machine company called Jaguar before being licensed to Singer for sale to US markets. And, as you might have guessed, the sewing machine operation software is the game cartridge required to operate the peripheral. In the vein of other creative suites like the Game Boy Camera, the Singer Isaac software lets you embroider a number of standard patterns or create your own custom stitch work from the console itself. As you can imagine, the machine did not sell very well in America, and pretty much flew under the radar when it was launched in 2000. Today, this operation software can sell for upwards of $120. This one stayed a little bit more consistent, but still has increased, and today will cost you about $145. Keep in mind, that's just for the loose cartridge. A complete set, including the machine itself, is likely to set you back hundreds. If you're interested in learning more about this obscure piece of Nintendo's history, Kelsey Lewin on YouTube has an excellent video showcasing her set of Game Boy sewing machines, so definitely check that out if you haven't already. I'll leave a link to her showcase video in the description below. And finally, coming in at number one, the rarest title for Game Boy Color is Shantae. If you're like me, you may be surprised to see such a well-known title at the top of one of these lists, but make no mistake, Shantae is a classic story of a game with a limited production run followed by a feverish cult following. While the series has now seen four published titles across more than ten platforms, it had much more humble origins, in no small part due to its release date. Because Shantae for Game Boy Color was released well into 2002, almost a year after the launch of the Game Boy Advance, most gamers overlooked the title and as a result it stayed in the shadows for nearly a decade before the launch of its first sequel. However, in recent years the series has made a major comeback and reached a much wider audience, causing huge demand for copies of the series' debut title. As of today, Shantae's market value has reached a whopping $350. And as you might have guessed, it has uh, continued to grow and is now worth about $650. For dedicated collectors, that's gotta hurt. But there's a reason the game is so sought after. Shantae is home to some solid platforming, beautiful pixel art, and some very impressive visual effects not often seen on the platform. So it's no wonder this cult classic has spawned a loyal following and become such a prized collector's item.
All right, so that was the Game Boy Color. Pretty interesting. Uh, some of those titles have shifted around in different ways, but those are still considered to be about the five most expensive Game Boy Color games. All right, so next up, going back to the handheld realm, we've got the top five rarest games for Game Boy Advance. Hey guys, Nintendrew here. It's that time again for the next installment of my Rarest Game series. Today, we'll be counting down through the top five most coveted and sought after titles for the Game Boy Advance. There are some pretty cool hidden gems on this list, so I hope you're as excited for this one as I am. Let's get to it. All right, as always, I've got to lay down a couple of ground rules. This list will only consider titles which were officially licensed in North America, and each title's position on this list is determined by its estimated scarcity as well as its current value on the retro game market. Again, price is not a perfect metric, but it is one of the best tools we have to determine a title's rarity considering both supply and demand. And of course, each game's price is in reference to its loose cartridge value. Additionally, for this video, I won't be considering Game Boy Advance video cartridges because they're not technically games. I'll have to save those for another video. So with that out of the way, first up is Car Battler Joe. Here's a genre for you. Car Battler Joe is an action RPG vehicular combat game which mixes demolition derby battle mechanics with role-playing elements. Players take on the role of the title's namesake, Joe, and accept various jobs from NPCs scattered throughout the game's overworld. The combat itself takes place during the trek between cities and is represented with Mode 7 style visuals, similar to F-Zero or Super Mario Kart. Completing objectives and finding hidden materials will help you to upgrade your car and take on increasingly difficult missions. When it was released in October of 2002, Car Battler Joe received generally positive reviews across the board, and critics praised the game for its unique combination of gameplay and depth of story. Today, the title can be found on the retro game market selling for right around $50. And today, about five years later, that value has more than tripled to about $180. It's not exactly clear why this title has become so rare, but retrospective reviews have highlighted it as one of the best games for the GBA, so certainly a resurgence in popularity and a renewed following have been some driving factors, no pun intended. Next up is Moto Racer Advance. If you happen to catch my earlier video showcasing 3D GBA games, you'll know I have a particular interest in games which push the limits of their hardware, and Moto Racer Advance certainly fits this description. While games like Car Battler Joe used Mode 7 to create the illusion of a 3D world, Moto Racer Advance uses a more complex technique to create more varied terrain with changes in elevation, like hills and valleys. The game features several different modes of play and a wide array of tracks across multiple environments. On top of this, each motorcycle in the game has a unique way of handling, with certain cycles being more suited to specific kinds of terrain. Critics praised the game across the board for its striking visuals and tight mechanics when it released in 2002, and today, Moto Racer Advance has risen in value to just about $55. And again, right in line with Car Battler Joe, Moto Racer Advance is also worth about $180 in 2023. Again, it's not really certain why this title has fallen into scarcity, but from a personal angle, I've got to say I've had a lot of fun with this one, and in my opinion, it stands as one of the best racing titles on the platform. I wouldn't be surprised if a resurgence in interest from the retro community contributed to supplies of this one drying up. But regardless, if you're a fan of racing games, you should definitely keep an eye out. At number three is Pocky and Rocky with Becky. Here's a familiar story. Yes, Pocky and Rocky is a notoriously sought after series of games for the Super Nintendo, but its demand is apparently not limited to its platform of origin. This third and final entry in the series also stands as one of the rarest titles available for Game Boy Advance. But you won't have to shell out quite as much cash to get a hold of this one. While Pocky and Rocky 2 still commands over $250 on the secondhand market, Pocky and Rocky with Becky goes for a somewhat more reasonable $70. Oh man, again, this one has just about tripled, and in 2023 will run you about 220 bucks. For those unfamiliar with the series, Pocky and Rocky is a top-down shoot-'em-up game in which players take on the role of Pocky, or in this case one of the two supporting characters Rocky or Becky, and shoot a barrage of talismans to take down enemies. It's not hard to imagine that, being a little-known sequel in an already obscure series, this title most likely saw a very limited print run. Add to that a strong cult following in recent years, and you've got yourself a recipe for rarity. Coming in at number two is Tiny Toon Adventures Scary Dreams. Now this one has a surprising backstory. This game was originally released in Europe under the subtitle Buster's Bad Dream, and is a side-scrolling beat-em-up platformer with supporting characters from the cartoon of the same name. 
Here's where it gets interesting, though. According to PriceCharting.com, the game was technically published by Conspiracy Entertainment in 2002, but never actually saw an official release on store shelves in the US. Apparently, copies of the game started to show up on eBay just a few years later, and it's assumed that the title was already through its first run of production when the publisher decided to pull the plug at the last minute. As a result, Scary Dreams is highly collectible and sells for over $70 online. <laughs> This one has also gone up, but not nearly as drastically. Uh, it's worth about $125 today. Honestly, when I found this title in my research, I didn't think much of it, being a TV tie-in. But after spending some time with it, I've gotta say, it's pretty fun. The combat mechanics allow for players to string together combos and knock enemies into each other to deal more damage. Overall, it's an entertaining little romp, and I'd recommend it for anyone who is a fan of the beat-em-up genre. And finally at number one, the rarest title for Game Boy Advance is Ninja 5.0. I've got to say, this is a great title to cap off the list. Ninja 5.0 is an action platformer which was developed by Hudson and published by Konami in 2003. In line with a story ripped straight from the 80s, you take on the role of Joe Osugi, a ninja police officer who must fight roving groups of gangs and terrorists to save the city while rescuing hostages. Much like the NES classic Bionic Commando, Joe has a trusty grappling hook at his disposal which lends itself to a unique and satisfying set of platforming mechanics. Much like many other Hudson Soft titles before it, Ninja 5.0 unfortunately saw a very limited release along with poor sales figures and has since jumped in value to over $130. And in 2023, it'll run you more than double at about 300 bucks. Since its release, Ninja 5.0 has been universally celebrated and is widely considered to be one of the very best titles for Game Boy Advance. This critical acclaim, in combination with its low print numbers, have secured it the number one spot on this list, making it the most sought-after title on the platform. So yeah, that was the Game Boy Advance, and uh, like I mentioned at the time, it, each of those titles are interesting in their own right, um, although it is rough that each of them have also either doubled or tripled in value since the time of that video. But what can you do? Moving right along, next up is the top five rarest titles for Nintendo GameCube. And we're definitely going back into the annals of history here because this is one of the earliest videos I ever uploaded in August of 2017. Hey guys, Nintendo here, and welcome to the next installment of my rarest game series. Today we're going to be taking a look at the five most obscure and coveted titles of the entire GameCube library. So if you're a collector, buckle up and hide your wallet as we run through the most expensive titles available for this little purple box. Let's check it out. Alright, so just to lay down a couple of ground rules here, uh, as always, this list's order is based on the price each game commands in the retro game market. Uh, so market value isn't a perfect metric, of course, but it is a pretty good starting point and is currently the best way and the clearest way we have to measure a title's rarity. And as always, this list won't contain any games which are part of a special release uh, and are otherwise commonly available for cheap. So for example, there's a Metroid Prime and Wind Waker combo pack which sells for more than any of the games on this list, but because each game is available separately for far cheaper, that combo pack will not be considered for this video. So with all that in mind, first up is Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. Path of Radiance is the ninth main entry in the Fire Emblem series, and the third to be released outside of Japan. It's also the first game in the franchise to feature 3D graphics, full motion cutscenes, and voice acting. Despite these various improvements, when Path of Radiance was released, Western audiences were still in the process of warming up to the series, so the franchise was not nearly as prolific as it is today. Add to that the fact that the game was released toward the end of the GameCube's lifespan, plus the modern surge of Fire Emblem fanaticism in the States, and you've got a recipe for rarity. Today, the game sells for just over $80 on the used game market. I believe I was doing loose values on this video, so actually today, just a loose copy of Path of Radiance will cost you over $200. Next up is NCAA College Basketball 2003. You might be surprised to see a sports title in the top five. I know I was. But it might make more sense when you hear that Sega canceled all 2K sports games for the GameCube midway through this game's production run. According to some reports, the game was only available on store shelves for less than two weeks before the production halt. As a result, the title has become very hard to hunt down, and at the time of this video, it can fetch prices upwards of $120 on the used game market. This one hasn't jumped quite as much, but a loose disc is still far too pricey at $160. Making it one of the very few sports titles to become a prize collector's item on any video game system. The game itself is not really anything to write home about, but its unique production story and limited print run have secured the title the number four spot on this list. Next up is Gotcha Force. 
Gotcha Force is a 3D arena battle game published by Capcom in 2003. Unlike some of the other titles on this list, this game didn't have a particularly limited or exclusive distribution run. Uh, the game was met with a lukewarm critical reception and as a result didn't sell quite as well as it could have, but shortly after it left store shelves, Gotcha Force developed a bit of a cult following and became a more sought after title in the years following. As such, the title is worth about $125 on the youth game market today. This one's pretty painful. Uh, just for a loose disc, it has almost doubled to about $330. And if you want a complete copy, be ready to shell out at least $200 more. What's really interesting is, in March of 2012, Capcom actually reprinted new copies of this GameCube exclusive title in Japan, a full nine years after its original release. Next up is Cubivore. Cubivore Survival of the Fittest is an action-adventure game by Intelligent Systems, and as the name might indicate, the game sees players fighting their way up the animal food chain by eating weaker animals to become increasingly strong and more powerful. The game was originally published in Japan by Nintendo themselves, but when Nintendo decided against bringing the title to the West, the title was picked up by publisher Atlas for further localization. Like many of Atlas's other titles, Cubivore saw a very limited production run outside of Japan, leading to widespread scarcity. As a result, at the time of this video, the game is worth just about $150 on the retro game market. And today, Cubivore runs about $325. And finally, at spot number one is Pokemon Box. Now, I was struggling with whether or not I should include this one on this list, because in the strictest sense, it's not really a game. But in the end, because it was an official title released on the platform, I felt it deserved to be included. Pokemon Box was a storage system for Pokemon games on the Game Boy Advance. It allowed players to transfer Pokemon they'd caught on the Game Boy Advance to a GameCube memory card. With this software, players could store up to 1,500 Pokemon on a standard 59-block memory card. As for its rarity, in the US, Pokemon Box was only available for a limited time from the Pokemon Center store in New York City, which today is known as the Nintendo World Store. Of course, due to this incredibly limited release, the title has become a prized collector's item and can be found on the used game market today for more than $220. Oh, this one is rough. Again, just for a loose disc, in 2023, Pokemon Box can go for over $1,300. Making it the rarest title on GameCube. All right, so that was the GameCube, and yeah, it's uh, it's not pretty. It looks like GameCube titles have pretty consistently gone up across the board. Another couple of titles I thought to mention here are uh, Disney Sports Basketball and Go Go Hyper Grind. Both titles, again, about $300 loose, and Disney Sports Basketball, a, a complete copy, actually goes for closer to 1000 So those are also increasing in value. And it looks like next up is, again, one of my favorite systems, the Nintendo DS. Hey guys, Nintendrew here. Once again, it is time for the next entry in our Rarest Game series. In this video, we'll be covering the top five most sought after and elusive titles for Nintendo's massively popular dual screen handheld, the Nintendo DS. So join me today as we take a look back at some of the most coveted titles in the DS library. Let's get to it. So, as always, first things first, we're going to cover a couple of ground rules for this list. Each of these titles were selected based on a number of factors, including current market value, production numbers, and demand. All prices are in reference to the loose cartridge North American releases, and as a result, we won't be considering any special or limited edition bundles for games which are otherwise available for cheap. This list in particular was pretty tough to put together, just because the DS is a relatively newer system and prices are still fluctuating. But one game in particular really threw me for a loop. Now, I wasn't able to find enough solid information to include it for this video, but make sure to stick around to the end for a special community challenge if you'd like to help out in the hunt for this title. So, with that out of the way, first up is Little Red Riding Hood's Zombie Barbecue. Little Red Riding Hood's Zombie Barbecue is a top-down rail shooter published by Destineer in October of 2008. The game pits players against a horde of zombies and other terrifying creatures in vertically scrolling levels through various fairy tale environments, with an occasional boss fight to shake up the formula. And to help take down those menacing enemies, you'll find a variety of weapons in each level, including shotguns, lasers, flamethrowers, grenades, etc. The gameplay feels almost like a quirky mix between Plants vs. Zombies and a scrolling shooter like 1942 or Xevious. And on the visual side, it combines gruesome enemies with a cute and bubbly aesthetic. Although its controls and mechanics are pretty simple, I found this title to be surprisingly challenging, even on the lowest difficulty setting. So it makes sense that in the years following its launch, the game managed to pique the interest of a niche hardcore audience. 
As a result, today Little Red Riding Hood Zombie Barbecue can fetch prices upwards of $45 on the used game market. And today, a little over four years later, a loose copy will run you just about double at 90 bucks. Again, this is for the loose cartridge value. Its rarity is also likely in part due to its relatively unknown publisher, and its more mature aesthetic in the otherwise kid-friendly ecosystem of the Nintendo DS library. Next up is Dokapon Journey. This game is the most recent entry in the Dokapon series, a franchise which has seen 10 titles across almost every generation prior, all the way back to its original debut on the Super Famicom. For those who don't know, this series is known for its hybrid gameplay, taking aspects from both the RPG and board game genres, almost like a harmonious mix of Mario Party meets Final Fantasy. In Dokapon Journey, you and up to three friends will pick from a selection of character classes and explore the overworld to compete for gold through a barrage of enemies and side quests. On a personal note, while I do love the idea of mixing a party game with RPG elements, this one didn't really manage to hold my interest, especially with rounds that can easily last over an hour. But I can imagine it would probably be a lot more fun with a full group of four human players. Regardless, today the game holds a significant market value, with loose copies selling for around $55. And of course today that has jumped further to about $100. This title's rarity is likely due to a severely limited print run, which is a story that has become all too common for its publisher, Atlas. But at the end of the day, Dokapon Journey represents a clever combination of mechanics from each of its inspirations. After that, we've got Magician's Quest Mysterious Times. This title is a very cute little game in which you move into a new town, become friends with its animal inhabitants, take on odd jobs, and generally just relax and take in the atmosphere. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yes, Magician's Quest is very, very similar to the massively popular Animal Crossing Wild World, which was released for the same system about three years earlier. And when I say similar, that's kind of an understatement. The characters' voices and the music, the mechanic of placing and moving furniture, and just the overall appearance feels uncanny. At some points, the games looked downright identical. So many aspects of Wild World were lifted, like the ability to create a town tune, a berry market for placing investments like Animal Crossing Stalk Market, the ability to design clothes with pixel art from limited palettes, even the fishing rod, bug net, shovel, and watering can. It's all here. This game is a blatant clone. But that being said, for what it's worth, it's a pretty good clone. The dialogue is entertaining and witty, there's plenty to see and do, and Magician's Quest does attempt to add its own flair with the magic spell and incantation systems. Today, a loose copy of Magician's Quest will run you upwards of $70. Aw oh man, I wish I'd hopped on this one back in the day because today, a loose copy will run about $120. Although the game sold pretty poorly in the US, resulting in scarcity, it seemed to grab a bigger audience overseas in Japan. But despite the publisher's best efforts, it was ultimately overshadowed by its predecessor, cementing its place at number 3 on our list. At number 2 is Sola Torobo Red the Hunter. Sola Torobo is a very polished action RPG title published in late 2011 by Xseed. It features beautiful full-motion animated cutscenes and a distinctive art style mixing 2D and 3D elements. The game follows the story of Red Saverin, an intrepid canine mercenary who pilots his own mini-mecha to take on foes throughout a network of floating ships and islands known as the Shepherd Republic. Throughout the main campaign, players will need to explore new land and rid each area of enemies, while also taking on the occasional side quest to help out the locals. The quest system reminds me a lot of that from the Monster Hunter series, and in true form, these tasks typically require Red to locate a target portion of the map and take down a specific foe or solve a series of puzzles. The game was fairly well received upon release, and to get your hands on a copy today, you'll have to shell out right around $80. And again, today that price has more than doubled to about $190. Solo Torobo's rarity is likely a product of two major factors. For one, it has attracted a devoted cult following in the years after its release, with fans clamoring for a continuation of the franchise. And two, this title was also given a somewhat limited print run stateside, thus decreasing supply and increasing demand. 
And finally, the number one rarest game for Nintendo DS is Shepherd's Crossing 2. This game is the 2010 sequel to Shepherd's Crossing on the PS2, published two years earlier, which was later ported to the PSP just months before the launch of its sequel. Both games in the series were produced in the wake of the success of Harvest Moon, in a genre which is more recently exemplified by the indie darling Stardew Valley. In Shepherd's Crossing 2, you're tasked with building a farm from the ground up with pretty much nothing but a sack of potato seeds and the clothes on your back. Taking actions in the world such as chopping trees and harvesting crops will advance the game's timer, and you'll want to make sure you have enough resources saved up each year to make it through the harsh winter and see another spring. Now, I'll be honest, I haven't spent much time at all playing the games that inspired this one, so I can't really comment on how it compares to the likes of Harvest Moon. But from what I have played, I found this title to be surprisingly addictive. It's almost got that cookie-clicker type of progression that makes you want to keep building up your resources and maximizing profits to keep expanding that agricultural empire. It would certainly be an easy recommendation, if it weren't so expensive. Today, Shepherd's Crossing 2 sells for a whopping $120 on the retro game market. And today in 2023, it's seen another nearly $100 price increase and is worth about $215. Again, that is for the loose cartridge, and a complete copy could set you back nearly twice that amount. As far as this one's concerned, it likely fell into obscurity due to a very unceremonious launch, and as a little-known title from a fairly unknown publisher, it was pretty much destined to fall through the cracks. Add to that a resurgence of demand from collectors, and you've got a recipe for rarity. Okay, so as far as I can tell, these are the top five rarest games for Nintendo DS. But like I mentioned, right before finishing this video, I came across some new information which could potentially blow these rankings out of the water. So with that in mind, here's one more title which might truly be the rarest Nintendo DS game of all time. Animaniacs Lights Camera Action is an isometric puzzle platformer released in 2005. The game sees players taking on the roles of Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, as well as Pinky and the Brain from their respective cartoon series. This title was released by Ignition Entertainment alongside a Game Boy Advance game of the same name, and for all intents and purposes they are pretty much identical, a point which would come back to haunt them once it was in the hands of critics. Throughout each level, you'll have to solve various puzzles and navigate each movie set while taking out your enemies by hurling tomatoes. More often than not, these levels can be incredibly tedious and frustrating, which is only made worse by the title's isometric perspective and wonky controls. At the time of its release, this one was almost universally panned by critics and players alike, and seeing how it was also released a full seven years after the end of the cartoon it was based upon, there's no wonder why it didn't fly off the shelves. As a result, today the game carries a staggering market value of... I don't know, we have no clue. Let me explain. As I mentioned at the beginning, this list is taking into account all titles in the North American NTSC region DS library. Across the pond in Europe, Animaniacs for DS isn't particularly common, but it's really not all that rare either. Now, Wikipedia says the game was released in America on November of 2005, but some reviews of the time listed it instead with an October release, so the info there is kind of fuzzy. In 2008, the popular value tracking site PriceCharting.com published an article which claimed that Lights Camera Action was one of the rarest DS games released in the US, with a market value at the time of $47. But if you follow that link to check out its more recent sales, you'll instead be redirected to a listing for its PAL region counterpart. In searching for information on this release, I could not find a single listing for the NTSC cartridge across eBay or Amazon, or anywhere else for that matter. Secondhand reseller sites like JJ Games and Lukey Games sometimes will have an order page for it, but as far as I can tell, they have always been sold out. In fact, I couldn't even find a single picture of the actual cartridge or its box, apart from its placeholder art used for store listings. I did manage to find the game's release code and UPC, but those haven't led anywhere useful either. So what happened to this thing? Well, as I mentioned, this game was absolutely slammed by critics when it debuted in Europe, about three months before its scheduled US release. My theory is that in the wake of bad press, the title may have been quietly cancelled just weeks or even possibly days before its launch in the States. Seriously, I could not find a single shred of evidence that this game ever hit store shelves in North America, despite release date listings in several online databases and rumors and hearsay to the contrary. 
Now, I actually managed to track down an email address for the former director of sales at Ignition Entertainment, who oversaw the launch of this title, but unfortunately he hasn't yet responded to my request for interview. So, here is my challenge to you, the viewers. If anyone is able to provide concrete evidence that this title was released in the US, or alternatively, proof that it was cancelled, or even better yet, if you're able to find and produce the actual cartridge, I'll make a follow-up to this video and bring you on the channel for a special interview about the game. I've done my best to thoroughly research its launch to try to confirm whether it was released or cancelled either way, but now I'm turning to the community. So make sure to let me know if you have any information at all in the comments below, and hopefully we can get to the bottom of what happened to this elusive title. All right, so there was the Nintendo DS. And yes, regarding that story about Animaniacs, it's still a mystery to me. I actually reached out and talked to some of the folks that were behind the launch of that game, or the rumored launch, I guess. Uh, and they claim that it did come out, but nobody knows where it went. It's still a mystery to this day. So let me know in the comments if you know anything about it. And it seems like the prices for those have pretty consistently doubled since the time of that video. But what hasn't been consistent is that the Pokemon games have also really blown up during that time, uh, especially during the pandemic. So all the Pokemon games on DS are at ridiculous prices now, too. That's a rant for another day. <laughs> but it looks like next up, we're going back to consoles with the top five rarest games for Wii. Hey guys, Nintendo here, and once again, it's time for the next installment in our Rarest Game series, where we take a look at some of the most coveted and elusive titles in gaming. This week, the Nintendo Wii. So, join me as we take a look back at the top five Rarest Wii games. Let's get to it! Okay, so as always, just a couple of ground rules. First off, we're not going to be considering any special edition titles or bundled games which are otherwise available for cheap. Just official retail releases. The prices listed in this video are based on complete North American copies, and each title has been ranked based on a combination of its current market value and estimated scarcity. So, with that out of the way, first up is Pandora's Tower. Pandora's Tower is a third-person action RPG developed by Ganbarion and first released in May of 2011 for a Japanese audience. But those of us in the rest of the world wouldn't get our chance to play this title until much later. After an extended development period and an unceremonious launch in Europe, Nintendo didn't have any plans to bring this title to North America. Around the same time, a movement named Operation Rainfall was picking up steam. This fan campaign aimed to convince publishers to bring three Japan-exclusive Wii titles to a worldwide audience. Pandora's Tower, Xenoblade Chronicles, and The Last Story. Eventually, all three titles would be released in North America, with Pandora's Tower finally hitting store shelves in April of 2013. Now keep in mind, this was a full six months after the release of the Wii U. Considering its extremely late print run and dedicated fanbase, it's no wonder that this game has climbed the charts and consistently held its value in recent years. Today, a complete copy of Pandora's Tower is worth right around 75 US dollars. <laughs> Interesting, okay, so Pandora's Tower has actually stayed at about the same price point over the past couple years, so it's still worth about 75 bucks. As far as gameplay is concerned, and given what I've played in recent memory, this title reminds me a bit of Astral Chain. If you're a fan of story-driven action-adventure games, Pandora's Tower is definitely one of the few titles on this list that I'd say might still be worth hunting down for a casual Wii collector. Next up, coming in at number four, is American Mensa Academy. Okay, so American Mensa Academy is kind of like a more pretentious version of Brain Age or Big Brain Academy. If you're not familiar with the organization, Mensa is self-described as the largest society of high IQ individuals in the world. So please, Rick and Morty fans only. Through a series of brain teasers across categories such as literacy, memory, and logic, American Mensa Academy promises to, quote, stretch your brain like no other game before. Today, a complete copy of American Mensa Academy will run you about $100 on the used game market. And again, American Mensa Academy is still worth right about $100, so no change. Marketing blurbs aside, for what it's worth, this game does feel reasonably polished and strikes me as almost like an edutainment version of the WarioWare series. Of course, as a fairly obscure title released just two days before the launch of the Wii U, it sold pretty terribly. As a result, it's unsurprisingly become much harder to come by in the years following its debut. Moving right along, at number three on our list is... Veggie World. OK, 
Okay, you know how when you're watching your favorite serial TV drama or sitcom and they bring on a character who you immediately just know is supposed to be a gamer? And then they show them playing some game with a generic PS2 looking controller, but the game footage has to be legally distinct so they don't risk any copyright infringement? This is that game. Veggie World is that generic nonsense game. You play as Oscar the Strawberry Boy on his quest to vanquish evil, I guess. The enemies are all fruits and veggies, but there are also bacteria? I don't know, I feel like I shouldn't have to put more thought into this game than the developers did. It's basically just a side-scrolling shooter where you have to take down waves of baddies that look like they came straight from a bad clip art website, and you're given the opportunity to upgrade your ship between each of the game's excruciatingly long levels. I think we can all agree, this one deserves to be in the most bargain of bargain bins, but it somehow managed to hold on to its inflated value. Today, a complete copy of Veggie World can also fetch upwards of $100. Oh man, I wish I had better news for you, but today that value has continued to inflate to about $220. Just to set the stage here, this game came out for the Wii in 2011. This is the same year we got some truly amazing titles like Skyward Sword, Rayman Origins, and Rhythm Heaven Fever. I guess only time will tell if Veggie World will be remembered alongside those celebrated adventures. Next up, coming in at number 2 is... Dokapon Kingdom. Dokapon Kingdom is a 2008 port of the PS2 game by the same name, which in turn is a remake of the original Super Famicom entry from all the way back in 1994. In this title, two to four players go head to head and fight for cash while collecting upgrades and vanquishing monsters. Battles take on the style of turn-based combat, while moving about the overworld is handled more like a board game. It's almost like a fun, casual hybrid of Mario Party and Final Fantasy. Longtime viewers might remember that another title in the Dokapon franchise, that being Dokapon Journey, was covered in this video series before as one of the rarest titles for Nintendo DS. While a complete copy of the DS game can sell for over $100, believe it or not, the Wii adaptation is even more pricey. Today, a complete used copy of Dokapon Journey is worth around $170. And shockingly, this one has actually really tanked. It's only worth about $80 today. I honestly might have to keep an eye out for this one and pick it up sometime. If you've played the Dokapon games before, you already know how fun they can be. And if you haven't yet, you're missing out. If you find this game in the wild at a decent discount and have a few friends to play with, don't hesitate to pick it up. And to round off our list, our number one rarest Wii title is... Cyberbike Cycling Sports. Yes, we finally have a fitness title at the top of one of these lists. In the era of the Wii's incredible financial success, everyone and their grandma was playing Wii Sports Tennis like there's no tomorrow, and clearance aisles were full of completely useless add-ons and peripherals. Ah, it was a simpler time. In an effort to capitalize on a new wave of fitness titles like Wii Fit and Just Dance, publisher Big Ben commissioned a new kind of controller for the system in 2011. A full-size stationary bike complete with magnetic resistance for building a challenging workout routine at home. Bundled with the Cyberbike was, of course, Cyberbike Cycling Sports. Through four modes of gameplay across land, water, and air, the game tasked players with controlling one of a selection of digital vehicles by pedaling and steering with the bike. Now, the software itself is hard enough to come by, and just a loose disc can fetch prices upwards of $70, but with the case, manual, and bike controller included, this title can fetch prices in excess of $200. Thankfully, this one hasn't exploded quite as much as some others, so it's, it's worth about $215 today. Interestingly enough, this is about the same price the game first launched at nearly a decade ago, which at the time was actually $50 more than a brand new Wii console, so it doesn't take a big stretch of the imagination to figure out why it didn't exactly fly off the shelves. But with listings already pretty well dried up, collectors can expect that Cyberbike will continue to be one of the most sought-after Wii games for many years to come. Okay, so that was the Wii, and that's pretty interesting. Uh, honestly, most of those titles pretty much stayed the same or, or even dropped in value, so that's that's nice to see. 
uh, outside of Veggie World, I guess. I, I didn't know what to expect with that. I, I haven't really been following the Wii market, so that's interesting to see that those titles have, have kind of stayed at the same level for, for a while. A rare occurrence for the retro game market. But when it comes to the Wii library overall, that list of the rarest games has honestly shifted and changed around quite a bit because the Wii is a little bit more recent, so the marketplace has had more of an opportunity to, to shift in the time since that video. And I'd imagine we're probably going to see a lot of that as we get toward the end of this list. Speaking of which, next up is the Nintendo 3DS. Hey guys, Nintendrew here. It's that time again for the next entry in our Rarest Game series, where we take a look at some of the most coveted and sought after titles in gaming. Today, the Nintendo 3DS is front and center. So join me as we take a look back at the top five rarest Nintendo 3DS games. Let's get to it. Okay, as always, just before we get started, let me get a couple of ground rules out of the way. First, this list will not be considering any special or limited edition titles, which are otherwise available easier or for cheap. And each title considered must be an official North American retail release. That means these titles actually hit store shelves and were available to the public. Each title has been ranked based on a combination of factors, including current market value, estimated scarcity, and demand. And finally, every price point that I'll mention in this video is based on the current US market value at the time of this video. So with that out of the way, First up at spot number five is Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology. Perfect Chronology is a 3DS remake of the acclaimed RPG Radiant Historia for the original DS. This version includes all new voice acting, updated artwork for each of the game's characters and cutscenes, added combat skills and maps, various quality of life improvements, and an entirely new additional storyline called Possible History that you can choose to weave into your adventure. As is the case with the original, this title was published by Atlas, a company notorious for small batch productions, and whose games have appeared many times in this video series. Atlas actually had to issue a second print run of the original Radiant Historia on DS in the US, as it had such a high demand in comparison to the supply of copies they initially produced, and that demand persisted to this reboot. As a result, today a complete copy of Perfect Chronology can run you about $80. Shockingly, this one's actually dropped a little bit in the two years since that video and is now worth about $70 complete. Now, the 3DS hardware was discontinued by Nintendo on September 16th of 2020, which likely contributed to the increase in prices and demand for these consoles and games. This one in particular shot up in price specifically at that time. If you haven't played it before, Radiant Historia offers a deep gameplay experience that has attracted a level of demand for good reason. Thankfully, it's still available digitally for half the price of a physical copy, so this one is mostly just for the collectors. Next up at spot number four is Dragon Quest VIII Journey of the Cursed King. Dragon Quest VIII is a 3DS port of the 2005 classic PlayStation 2 RPG. Through the journey of the Cursed King, players must step into the role of the hero, working with party members to hunt down and destroy the evil source of a terrifying curse. The Entourage explores landscapes and cities of a fully realized 3D world, replacing the top-down view of the previous games and fighting in turn-based encounters that the series has come to be known for. Dragon Quest VIII in particular is highly regarded as one of the best entries in the series and highly sought after for that reason. Combine that with the worldwide success of the Nintendo 3DS, and you have a perfect storm for massive demand. Today, a complete copy of Dragon Quest VIII is worth right around $100. And again, we've got a little bit of a price cut here. In 2023, it's worth about $80. As far as how it reached that price point, this one's story is a little interesting. Prices for this game, as well as many other highly regarded games, have skyrocketed since the beginning of COVID-19. Due to the need for quarantines and social distancing, as well as the closing of many sources of entertainment, the comfort of nostalgia and appeal of online shopping and collecting shot up, which sparked higher demand for the physical copies that are no longer being sold by retailers. Now, this title is also still available digitally on the eShop, so if you want to check it out, you don't have to shell out $100 or be forced to miss out. Or, of course, you can always just grab the PS2 original for about 25 bucks on the secondhand market. Coming in at spot number three is Yokai Watch 3. Would you look at that? Another RPG. I promise this is the last one. Yokai Watch 3 is, appropriately enough, the third installation in the Yokai Watch series. 
You play as a pair of detectives investigating mysterious cases, meeting and befriending hundreds of friendly yokai, battling the bad yokai and bosses using a new grid-based combat system, and eventually join forces with each other and their yokai teams to face a common enemy. This title was originally released in two separate versions in Japan, titled Sushi and Tempura, much in the same vein as the mainline Pokemon series. The third version of the game, known in Japan as Yokai Watch 3 Sukiyaki, was released in December of 2016 and was considered to be the definitive edition of the game, with all available content combined, including American themed yokai and new areas and features. This was the version that was eventually released in the US in February of 2019. Today, the game can fetch upwards of $125 for a complete copy. Well, I knew our luck had to run out at some point, and uh, today, a complete copy will run you about $315. In a story that is becoming all too familiar, this game had a very short print run, likely due to the fact that Yokai Watch 4 was confirmed for a Western release in the same month as this game's release, so both the 3DS and Yokai Watch 3 were nearing the end of their popularity. In fact, it's estimated that under 5,000 copies could have been sold in North America, and many stores reported receiving only a few copies apiece. For such a major title published by Nintendo themselves, that number is incredibly low. And as a result, Yokai Watch 3 is expected to hold its value for the foreseeable future. At number two on our list is Alien Chaos 3D. Alien Chaos 3D is a side-scrolling shooter from Swedish developer Ludosity Interactive. When alien robot animals invade and abduct the protagonist's mom with their UFO, it's up to you to use an arsenal of weapons to blast through hordes of enemies and rescue her. Technically, this game is a sequel to the little-known Mama and Son Clean House, an indie Xbox Live title, and the dev team originally wanted to call it Clean House, but the publisher changed it at the last minute to the more generic Alien Chaos 3D making its connection to Ludosity's Mama and Son series unclear. Now, just looking at this gameplay, you can probably imagine how low this game's print run was. In fact, this game was originally only available digitally and only from the European eShop. So when it came stateside, nobody really knew about this game and didn't have a reason to pay attention. Today, a complete copy of Alien Chaos 3D can fetch upwards of $175. Oof, and in just a couple years, that value has ballooned further to about $345. Now, in the case of this game, supply and demand were both exceedingly low at the time of its launch, which ultimately led to scarcity. Even the level designer, editor, and programmer Daniel Remar noted that they made the game in just six months and said himself that it could be described as shovelware, albeit still fun to play. And because of its niche appeal and jaw-dropping price tag, this one is generally only for the hardcore collectors. And finally, the last title for today's video, and the number one rarest game for Nintendo 3DS is... Barbie Groom and Glam Pups. Yes, finally a real quality title to finish off our list. In Barbie Groom and Glam Pups, players will choose a puppy from one of six adorable breeds, then groom, train, and dress them up as fabulously as possible with a collection of clothes, collars, accessories, and costumes. Along the way, Barbie will give you tips and advice to help you prepare your pup to ultimately be shown off in various canine competitions, including a freestyle dance-off, fashion show, and photo shoots. Now, if you've happened to see one of these at your local game store, don't grab your keys and head out to nab it just yet. While Groom and Glam Pups is exceedingly valuable for 3DS, the same title was released for DS and Wii a few years earlier, and that version is much easier to come by for dirt cheap. Now, for the 3DS version, it's a little difficult to estimate a fair price point just because this game is so rarely seen on the secondhand market. But in recent months, a complete inbox copy of this title has fetched prices in excess of $800. Yeah, this one's just stupid. In 2023, it's worth about $3,350. Yes, I am serious. If you're like me, your first question is why? Well, it's actually pretty hard to find any official information on the history of this release. Most of the information here was pulled from various anecdotal accounts and forum posts. But as I understand it, although the Wii and DS versions were plentiful, this 3DS port had very few copies made and was pulled from store shelves quickly after selling poorly. On top of that, the NTSC North American release was apparently only sold through stores in Canada, resulting in inflated scarcity. 
Groom and Glam Pups was also delisted from the Nintendo eShop in 2017, most likely due to the publisher's license agreement with Mattel expiring. For all these reasons, Barbie Groom and Glam Pups is exceedingly difficult to find and is sure to be a prized collector's item for many years to come. Alright, so that was our second to last system, the 3DS. And at first I thought we were going to get lucky there. A couple of those titles that actually dropped in value, but man, that Barbie Groom and Glam Pups. <laughs> Alright, and that brings us, of course, to our final system for this video, which is the Wii U. And since I just put out this video a, a little while ago, I'm not going to interject with new values. The values have stayed pretty much the same since the month that I posted them. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hey guys, Nintendrew here. The Wii U is a great system to collect for right now. While older consoles' libraries are skyrocketing in price on the used game market, the Wii U hasn't really seen the full collector effect as of yet. But that's not to say it doesn't have its fair share of hard-to-find and expensive titles. So today, we're taking a look at the top 5 rarest games for Nintendo's ill-fated tablet-based system. Let's get to it. Alright, as usual, the titles in this list will be sourced from the North American Wii U library, and we're not considering any special or collector's edition releases that are more readily available in some other form. And finally, each game's price will be based on a complete in-box copy's value at the time of this video. So with that out of the way, first up at spot number 5 is Game & Wario. As you might have guessed from its visuals, Game & Wario is an entry in the WarioWare series, although it doesn't follow the exact same format as most of the other titles in the franchise. Instead of being host to an absurd number of frantic micro-games, this title presents a much more manageable 16 mini-games that are a bit more fleshed out than you might have come to expect from a traditional WarioWare outing. Now, I do feel a bit weird including a first-party Nintendo title here as one of the rarest Wii U games, but generous sales estimates put this entry at just 250,000 copies sold in North America, which is abysmal for a first-party Nintendo game, especially when you compare that figure to the earlier WarioWare Smooth Moves, which saw literally 10 times the number of sales. Today, a complete copy of Game & Wario will run you about $110 on the used game market. Because this was an original Wii U title, and due to the nature of the game's design, it doesn't translate very easily to any other system, and likely won't see a port anytime soon. So if you're at all a fan of the WarioWare series and are collecting for Wii U, it's definitely worth picking up, assuming you can find a good deal. Next up at number 4 is... Axiom Verge Multiverse Edition. Now listen, I know I said we weren't going to look at any special edition releases, and usually I wouldn't include something like this in a Top 5 Rarest video. But because it was the only physical copy of the title available for this platform, it's technically eligible. That is to say, there is no standard release for Axiom Verge on Wii U, unless you managed to nab it on the eShop before it went dark. Axiom Verge is a Metroidvania-style action-adventure game, and has been widely praised as one of the greatest indie titles of its generation. Because this version was published through Limited Run Games, we actually know how many have been produced, and the answer is not much. This package was limited to just 6,000 physical copies, which has no doubt contributed significantly to its current market value. Today, a complete copy of Axiom Verge Multiverse Edition will run you right around $160. At the time of its release, this was the first instance of Axiom Verge appearing outside of the PC and PlayStation ecosystems, but today you can just as easily get it on the Nintendo Switch, so this one is pretty much just for the hardcore collectors out there. Alright, coming in at spot number 3 is... Turbo Super Stunt Squad. Yes, I'm serious. I'll be honest, this title was a little difficult to research, mainly because, like so many video games based upon films that came before it, its launch was so underwhelming and unceremonious that almost nobody paid attention to it. There isn't even a Wikipedia article on this game, that's how far it flew under the radar. As you've probably already gathered, Turbo Super Stunt Squad was a racing tie-in game for the 2013 film of the same name, Turbo. Despite earning over $280 million on a $127 million budget, the film was considered a bit of a box office flop, and as you can imagine, the game suffered a fate that was just as bad if not much worse. If you weren't one of the few people who picked up a copy from store shelves, today the title will run you about $200 at resale. 
As far as reception is concerned, Super Stunt Squad was almost universally panned by critics, cementing it as a shovelware title on an already underperforming console, which likely led to some abysmal sales figures. So if you don't have this one yourself, you can rest easy knowing you're probably not missing out on too much. Moving right along, at number two is The Book of Unwritten Tales 2. As the name suggests, this is the 2015 sequel to the 2009 point-and-click adventure The Book of Unwritten Tales. This game features not one, not two, not three, but four independently controlled protagonists that will accompany you throughout the main story. Much like we discussed with Axiom Verge, there are more convenient and cheaper ways to play this one if you just want to experience the game, and partially due to the fact that this was the first physical copy available, the Wii U release is the only version with a similarly outrageous price tag. As of the time of this video, a used inbox copy of The Book of Unwritten Tales 2 is likely to run you a staggering $265. Now, my usual source for sales data, VGCharts.com, has no North American data for this title, so we have no real way of knowing how few copies might be out there in the wild. So if you happen to come across this little-known sequel while game hunting, make sure to give it a second glance. And finally, at spot number one, the rarest title for Wii U is Devil's Third. Devil's Third was released relatively late in the Wii U's lifespan, owing mainly to an extended period in development hell. Originally slated to be an Xbox 360 exclusive, the game's production was set back by multiple publisher bankruptcies during its 8-plus year development period. Eventually, Nintendo came to the rescue and decided to pick up the title as a Wii U exclusive in order to fill an M-rated gap in the console's library. Today, if you want to pick up a used copy of Devil's Third, be ready to fork over a whopping $330. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not generally considered to be a good game, but it's certainly interesting nonetheless. Despite an initially positive reception to its release in Japan, the game was almost universally panned when it launched internationally which no doubt contributed to its underwhelming sales. And because it's a title that can only really be experienced on this platform, Devil's Third has firmly cemented its place at number one. All right, so that's gonna do it for me today. Thank you all so much for watching this marathon style video of all of my top five rarest games videos. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know down in the comments, what did you think? Uh, what was your most interesting takeaway from this video? I think for me, the most interesting thing was to see that some of those Virtual Boy titles have actually been going down in price over the past couple of years, which uh, is, is nice that it's becoming a little bit more approachable maybe for some new collectors. Uh, and definitely the Wii U is still in a, a great space, a good starting point for new collectors trying to, to build a, a library. Thank you so much for joining me on this long expedition through both Nintendo's history and the history of my channel. It's interesting to look back and see some of those earliest days and, and how the channel has progressed. I, at least I hope it has. <laughs> but yeah, let me know down in the comments what you thought and if you'd like to see any more sort of compilation videos on this channel. And otherwise, I'll see you next time. Bye.